thank you all for joining us here today for a virtual artist talk with artist in residence, Colby Charpentier. My name is Paul Roach. I serve as the Director of Advancement and Communications here at AMOCA. I'm standing in today for AMOCA's Executive Director, Beth Ann Gerstein, who sends her regards and wishes that she could be here to join us. Launched in 2012, AMOCA's Artist in Residence program is one of the few long-term residency opportunities for ceramic artists on the West Coast. Located an hour from the desert, mountains, and beaches of Southern California, and about 40 minutes east of downtown Los Angeles, the residency provides artists an opportunity to produce or develop a new body of work while also participating in AMOCA's programs. Artists receive a stipend for weekly expenses, a housing stipend, a firing stipend, a material stipend, and 24-7 access to a semi-private studio. The program is generously supported by grants and gifts from the Wingate Foundation, Julianne and David Armstrong, and the Laguna Clay and Glaze Company. 16 artists have participated in the residency program so far, with our most recent resident, Grayson Fair, now serving as a resident at the Clay Studio of Missoula in Montana. Applications to serve as a resident artist are accepted on an annual basis, with the next round opening in December 2021. In fact, we just had a meeting yesterday discussing uh, how that's going to roll out. So we hope that uh, if you're interested, you'll apply. And if you know folks who would be great candidates, please do send them our way. We look forward to welcoming the next set of residents. Colby Charpentier, who joined us this fall from a residency at Goggle Works in Reading, Pennsylvania, is a process-oriented sculptor dedicated to the exploration of ceramic materials. His artistic process, grounded in a study of historical and contemporary materials production, deconstructs and reinterprets traditional vessel forms with visually arresting studies of texture, form, and color. Colby's artistic works are a tenuous balance of chaos and order and a meditation on the tension between the organic and the ethereal. Colby received his MFA from the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills uh, and his BFA from Alfred University in Alfred, New York. He has served as a resident artist at the Morian Center for Clay in St. Petersburg, Florida, Sonoma Ceramics in Sonoma, California, and most recently, the Harvard Ceramics Program in Boston, Massachusetts. Colby has taught at the Massachusetts College for Art and Design, Harvard Ceramics Program, and been the recipient of numerous awards. Most recently, he was awarded the top prize at the International Porcelain Design Competition, the Franz Rising Star Award. Colby will be in residence uh, until April, 20, April 2022, and he joined us just this past October. Colby, we're thrilled to have you, and thank you so much for joining us here today for an artist talk. Take us away. Great. Thanks, Paul. All right. Um, uh, so today what I have prepared is sort of a, it'll be a visual bombardment. Um, we have 160 slides to roll through, and this is set up as a, a sort of more biographical end of things. And I'm hoping that towards the end of the time here, we can do a look back and look at the research and everything that happened while here. Um, so let's hop right into it. And looking for our slides. There we are. All right. Um, just off the bat, this is a quick um, map just to get an idea of places that I've spent at least more than a month at. Most of these places uh, a year plus. And um, I've been super fortunate um, for all the, the sort of support and the ability to, to make work and make things happen. And um, the route that we took to get here has been sort of meandering. Um, and as I'm going through all these different places, um, everything's different, the materials, the, the people, the places. Um, but we're sort of hoping that, that by the end of this, uh, we can get the map to look a little bit like this. Um, uh, but anyway, to, uh, so to back things up, um, uh, took a class in high school, um, ceramics and, um, uh, from there, um, we got this invitation from an instructor, um, uh, Bruce Lenore, to, to go back to his house and move some bricks around, build some wood kilns, and um, play with fire. Um, and from there, um, I was able to do an internship at a, a local clay studio and just sort of started making work and, and went through that, um, that sort of college experience um, thinking maybe I'll be an engineer, maybe I'll be a clay artist, um, but definitely centered around pots. Um, and so that, like this is a, a picture um, from undergrad. 
and um, started doing some glass work. And then this is sort of the, the moment where after doing some of that glass work, coming back to clay, um, just bringing some of the, those, um, you can see in the goblets, um, some of the Venetian ideas there. And um, so in, in the summertime, there, there wasn't always a ton to do. Um, but I definitely liked clay, I definitely liked fire, and I wanted to play around. Um, so this here is a shopping cart kiln. Um, uh, Bruce Lenore built the, the sort of base for this. And I went in and sort of figured out how we could fire this thing off and, and get this thing to temperature. Um, and the amazing thing about this kiln is that with propane, it fired off to cone 10 in about three hours. Um, so, you know, for, for non-clay people, we're talking 2,300 degrees. Um, and then cold to cold, I could do a firing in about six hours. Um, so there, there was one day I didn't like the firing. I just took the cart, um, you know, sort of let things cool off, looked at everything. I was like, ah, that's not great. And just threw the burner back in there, fired it off again, and it was good to go. Um, back in undergrad, um, and... Really, um, I guess the, these ideas of open forms, as I'm looking back through some of this work, um, uh, clay is a really heavy material, and, and there's just something about getting stuff, um, getting space into that stuff that, that really sort of um, kind of subverts what clay is as a material, and it's really nice. Um, and and it, so all this work at undergrad is at Alfred University, and... I mean, it was a time where I could just get into all sorts of trouble um, with the material. Um, so this is a sample um, from an electric kiln firing, um, and it's meant to mimic um, uh, reduction firing. Um, so it's porcelain. Um, there's a bunch of sprayed soda, um, uh, some iron to create some localized reduction. Um, and again, just the fact that this comes out of an electric kiln is, is sort of amazing. Um, some of the other trouble that we'd get into, um, did some uh, clay welding, um, and I don't have pictures of this, um, but we snuck an oxyacetylene torch out of the glass department right into the Alfred Kiln room. Um, we uh, put some, some porcelain uh, tiles in the test kilns and, and brought that up um, uh, to bisque temperatures. And you know, we put on gloves and equipment and heated up the edges of the, um, the porcelain. And when it got ripping hot, just sort of pressed everything together and ended up with these really beautiful welded porcelain samples. Um, and you'd actually see the, the white porcelain, there'd be this sort of like carbon fuming on the outside. And then this like gooey yellow glass holding everything together. Um, wish I had pictures, but, um, that was sort of a great time to, to get everything done and just get into trouble. Um, so after undergrad, applied for a ton of opportunities and really didn't get much. Um, ended up, this is a uh, parking lot before doing some valet parking. Um, and it was really just, you know, sort of trying to survive, make ends meet. Um, and after that first summer, um, after undergrad, I was able to start working um, uh, for Chris Gustin. Um, who's a sculptor and, and wood fire uh, potter. Um, made a lot of tile in his studio and um, just a lot of sort of studio assistant um, work. Um, so I know like the first day I showed up, um, we're throwing these like massive platters, um, these uh, probably about 30 inches when they're, they're fired, um, but they're made out of 62 and a half pounds of clay. Um, so my job was sort of to come in and center that two and a half bags of clay, 62 and a half pounds, um, onto the wheel. And, and he'd come through and, and he'd, you know, finish the throwing. And um, it was just sort of a great uh, learning experience. The other artist I worked for a, a ton for, for, you know, that same three years um, was Dan Clayman. This is large scale uh, cast glass work. Um, there's a lot of projects that were just ambitious and built, and, and I think a lot of that sort of logic is something that's um, really stuck into my work. Um, you can see with a, a human for scale here, um, this is a 1,500 pound boulder. Um, 
one of the projects I worked on for Dan um, where we cast um, all the surface pieces of the boulder and then sort of reconstructed um, the boulder in, in glass. Um, also got to do some production work, um, taking these wooden models and, and going through and, and just uh, doing the glass translations and sort of learning. One of the great things um, in Dan's studio was just how open everything was. So with the projects, I had full reign to go in and, and sort of um, say, hey, I think we can do this a little better. And there'd be full permission. Yeah, let's try it out. Let's see what we can do. Uh, and then through that, um, just some connections to do uh, some side projects or installation work. Um, uh, so this is June Kaneko install. Um, couldn't get photos of the actual Karen Lamont install. Um, it was this wild situation of, you know, like you take your shoes off and you put the white gloves on and um, you sort of have to like lift these glass sections into place and understand like we have one shot to sort of place these right. Um, this is a myelin piece that we worked on through Dan's studio. Uh, myelin, uh, probably most famous for the Vietnam War Memorial um, in DC. Um, but just fabricating these little glass dams um, uh, for this Narragansett Bay um, uh, topography out in Rhode Island. Um, so this is a photo of uh, myself, uh, Chris, and uh, Craig Hartenberger came into the picture. Um, really great fan, uh, amazing artist. Um, I got this invite to go out and, and do this Nina Hole sculpture. And um, it was a crazy experience out in, um, in Indiana. Um, we have about 6,000 pounds of clay um, building from these, these slab components. Um, you can see we start getting on the scaffolding there. And the kiln itself, uh, or rather the, uh, the sculpture itself actually becomes the kiln. Um, you know, so the, these, the, this thing ends up being 12 feet tall. And after about three weeks of building, just nonstop day and night, um, everything gets wrapped up in fiber and fired immediately. Like no drying time, just starting to stoke wood. At the end, everything, um, the fiber gets pulled off and, and there's this beautiful glowing um, sculpture there. I think that's a moment where I, I thought I had some moments of like working hard with clay or, or sort of understanding what it was to be going away and, and doing that grind. But um, th this was just something else entirely. Um, so that still stands out in um, uh, Purdue University. Um, and, you know, in the meantime, uh, still uh, at that, uh, this Pawtucket studio in Duclaw. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a clay studio making some electric fired pots and, and sculpture in between. And there's a certain sort of rhythm to the way all this happens. Um, it's, it's sort of constantly swapping. Um, it's, I, I don't know what that says about, like, uh, patience or, or repetition or any of that stuff, but um, definitely maybe that I have a slightly short attention span, um, but maybe not much patience for the long term. Um, so this is um, uh, the Gustin Anagama, uh, which has some back chambers on it, and um, got to fire that a bunch. Um, it was a really nice experience, especially leading those night shifts. Um, and sort of be a space of, of being left a little bit, um, you know, to your own devices with a small group of people to just sort of figure out, um, you know, how to make it happen. And, and with just hundreds and hundreds of pots and, and sort of a lot of responsibility, you know, lying on that for these week-long firings, um, a really nice time. And, um, you know, so I'm flopping back and forth between this electric-fired work and this wood fire work and some of the sculpture. And um, when I'm firing the wood kiln, it's really nice. And uh, this is with some Gustin Shino, um, which turns out looks fabulous in the Gustin Anagama. Um, you know, but I started to get to a place where, where I was like, well, I, I think I need to own my surfaces a little bit more. And, and I, I know what that kiln is good at, but I need to, you know, develop something that I can own a little bit. And so it's really just starting to get some, some surfaces to do all the good stuff for how Chris is firing, um, but not his glazes. 
And, and some of this, I mean, just the, the phenomenology, just the, the, the beauty in this stuff is unbelievable. And it's, you know, I don't care if you, you know, you put a hundred pots in and you get, you know, one of them that's good to go. I mean, this stuff is, for those one or two pots that come out, I mean, they are, they're something special. Um, let's see if we can play this real quick. Um, this is another uh, project that I'd done for a member of that firing group. It's a 21 part um, mold with uh, slip casting mold um, with a six part suspended core. And um, all these little projects are, are things that, you know, maybe it's not direct influence on my practice, but just the ability to go in and figure these things out really help sort of push and, and expand some of the technical um, facility. And, um, and this is towards the end of my time as a studio assistant, um, really just sort of narrowing in on um, sort of like styling and, and, and um, you know, vi visual language and, and taking these mugs and, and just trying to make, um, make something more. Uh, so from that, you get the opportunity to go out to uh, Sonoma, California and uh, get to ride this beautiful pink bicycle. Um, so I went out there um, on a plane, uh, had no car for six months and rode my bike like this to get groceries. Um, if you can imagine, um, I got pulled over like not once, but, but multiple times um, for going too fast on this bicycle. Uh, so that, that was, a, was a nice little thing there. Um, so I show up and, um, you know, what I'm finding is um, I just need to create momentum. And, and that's sort of a big thing in the studio. Um, so it's creating momentum, but it's also um, trying to figure out some of that sort of improvisational energy and, and sort of how things um, work. You know, so it's, I mean, this is, uh, I can't count, but however many this is, it's just sitting there and... and figuring out how many different moves can we put on the clay. And um, really looking at some of the Hill and, and Burn um, uh, Betcher photographs um, of water, water towers all over the, the world and starting to sketch out and, and just find possibilities and then starting to bring that sort of into, into being. Um, got to take a, a quick trip out to Penland um, with uh, Dan and um, this woman, uh, Caitlin Becker, who does robotics um, um, up at Harvard and um, got to learn some, some computer modeling and just sort of, um, I hounded Kate for like two weeks just asking all these questions and figuring out how to model. Um, and, that, and that sort of opened the door, um, maybe not even so much um, for projects as much as just sort of visualizing and, and sort of being able to run through work and, and sort of understand work in space um, without going through the whole ceramic process. Um, and really just cranking in this um, Sonoma residency. Uh, God, gravity, we, we all sort of feel it. And, and I think that's what comes um, when you have structure um, as you start to really, um, you understand what's going on there. Um, so I had to learn some tricks for, for how to build this work um, as these start getting into that, um, you know, two foot um, range. Um, and so one, one of the quick tricks here I was figuring out was I could sort of post up um, um, these sort of top bits and all the coils could get sort of manipulated while they're soft. They'd set up a little bit. And when I go and build... Um, I just sort of fill in the in-between, make all those attachments, clean everything up. And as everything dries, um, the, the flex of the bamboo just sort of allows everything to shrink nice, nice. Um, and you can see here that that bow in the bamboo is just that, that shrinkage as everything sort of settles in. Um, this is some of the, the show installed um, out there in California. Um, and just understanding that um, everything's just really tumbling through ideas and just really trying to get get through everything and figure out as much as we can. And so that gets us out to Florida. 
Um, and these transitions are abrupt. I mean, it's it's probably, a, I think it was a week or so um, where I flew from, from uh, California right out to Rhode Island, spent a couple days, repacked everything, and drove back down to Florida. Um, and so Florida was nice. I had already been there um, on a workshop um, uh, with Chris. Um, and so I understood, like, th this is their kiln pad. It's a serious thing. Um, tons of just opportunities and, and ability to just make things happen. Um, and that first month, I, I had two shows I had to square work for. So it was moving in and getting two shows worth of work made in the span of a month, which was mind-blowing. And I, I had this quick study um, from Sonoma. And, th and that's sort of the way a lot of this works is that I'll always be testing and, and sort of being my own sort of R&D department as this goes. And so with those drawings, I'm, I'm starting to sort of build out in clay. And see process wise, you know, you sort of start and doing little push outs and push ins and, and just sort of cleaning things up and, and just going through these rounds of work um, that are really just trying to get into that motion and that structure and, and some of that stance and um, yeah. Um, it's kind of, it's always fun to like see in the studio on the shelves, like all the models and things. Um, I sort of forget like how much, um, in the practice is just making these little tests and, and exploring like how much things are going to scale up and all that while just, um, I knew from the start, I, I didn't want to be like a, a full-time potter. Um, but I really like pots and, and the way it sort of creates momentum and, um, the time space of like making a cup and, and sort of understanding some things is really nice. And that allows me to, to sort of get through those moments where I'm, I'm sort of stuck or, or having to push through with bigger projects. Um, and th this is actually where that digital modeling came back. Um, you know, f a few months later, um, where, um, you know, making these models and taking molds off of this and then putting the molds onto the wheel and, and throwing the bowls into the, the molds. And, um, you know, so it's like you're getting this molded outside with all this detail and information, but it still has a thrown rim and still has a trimmed foot. Um, you know, so it's, it's sort of, um, you know, I understand uh, like 3D printing and there's some cool processes in there. Um, but then it's starting to ask, like, well, how does that become a tool that we can sort of bring back into the practice? And, um, and all the while, still looking at those um, Byrne and Hillebetcher photographs. And um, just one view of, of the show install. Um, but just starting to put this stuff together in a room and starting to understand um, how everything connects and how everything comes together. And that's probably the toughest, toughest thing in studio that we're constantly fighting with. And yeah, so right after Florida, um, it's up to um, the Harvard Ceramics program. Um, <laughs> Duncan on every quarter. Um, and as it goes, um, the research is constantly going on. When I went out to the Harvard program, I sort of knew that this is what I wanted to get into. And this is a little test in Florida. And I'm, I'm constantly in this moment of, of wanting to try out uh, things that are maybe a little wacky and wild. Um, for any potters or ceramics people, um, this is a very simple um, level test where um, I've got a, a glaze, a low fire 04 glaze, and can barely make out the markings. Um, so it's silica additions to this glaze. It's on a plaster platform um, and fired, what did we fire it to? Uh, we probably fired it to, to 04 or cone one or six, something. Um, but the additions of silica. So we've got 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%. 40%, this is a glaze with 50% addition of silica, 100% addition, and 150% addition of silica. And, you know, I was looking at this, and, and it doesn't look like much, but 
towards the very end of that test, that's essentially a, a, a fused silica clay body again. I mean, that's like that's what Turkish tile is. It's similar to, to Egyptian paste. Um, it's stuff we can work with. Um, and, you know, so uh, being a potter and, 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 you know, sort of wanting to make things, it sort of made sense to start making um, cups. And, and one of the things I was aware of really quick is I'm always looking for these opportunities. Um, because these things are, are I'm essentially putting it in a squirt bottle and just squeezing out these little droplets, I can switch up colors or do anything that I want because each bead is individually placed. Um, the other really nice thing is because the clay content is so low, by the time you add um, uh, all that silica in, there's only 3.5% clay content. So this is very much like when you're at the beach, very sandy. Um, you know, so, you, so I place this onto the plaster platform and the material flows, the water gets drawn out, and then it freezes in place. Um, and just starting to build these up. Um, it's hard to tell on scale for a lot of these, but maybe an 11 inch cylinder. Um, and then just really starting to push out and uh, becoming aware very quickly um, of, of how this stuff just wasn't clay. And clay has its own problems, but but this stuff is just, it's finicky, it's powdery and, and everything really just, you know, it's it's tough. So, um, yeah, and, and what I find is when, when I talk about momentum, some of what I'm talking about is this stuff's falling apart like all the time. And, and I have zero um, sort of chance or control or way of knowing what's going to work and what's going to not. Um, so we're, we're just trying this stuff out. We're changing the firing temperatures. Uh, it's really exciting in here to see like some of the materials start to flow again. Um, you know, but... It, gets us to a point where um, this is as we're getting to that holiday um, sale in Harvard and still probably in that 2018 range. Um, got to take a break and got to make some pots. Um, still still in the sort of long drawn out process, um, but really enjoying that. And I mean, that goes back to, to the tile and everything else. Um, just being able to sort of lock in and, and enjoy the, the process. And, and once we've gotten through that, then it's sort of that moment where we can return again and we can say, okay, stuff wasn't working out. We sort of reset and we can come back at it. Um, we can all sort of manage um, so much failure and, and so much success and, and all that sort. And, and I think that's mostly what it's about is like, how much not stuff working can I tolerate? Um, and then starting to take opportunities with some of the, the rubber dipped wire, um, you know, it, it sort of creates these, these other opportunities. Um, and that allows us to start getting back into this, um, these larger builds. I mean, the, the tough thing is it doesn't take a lot of change to make big differences in the work. Um, but there is this feedback loop and, and it's sort of, um, some of the work is architectural, but some of what's most captured um, in terms of the architecture is, is maybe that idea of like the model and that things can scale. Um, yeah, so more things falling apart, and that's the constant back and forth. But eventually, you know, things start working, and, and some of that's pushed by deadlines, and some of that's just pushed by doing enough and, and sort of pushing through those moments of not working. All the while that this is going on, um, you know, I'm, I'm teaching a ton of classes, um, just having a lot of exchange, um, just teaching at MassArt. Um, I was also getting to work um, um, with the, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. Um, so that's their, their architecture program. Um, and just sort of working with these students that have these wild ideas of, of like, 
uh, we want clay to be able to migrate water, you know, water across the surface in this way. We want things to look like this. Um, I want to have a robot like put this stuff together. Um, and I got to be a project advisor for that and sort of help out in the ceramic end of things. Um, and so that sort of just encourages me more to go through this testing, um, make these clays that are sort of falling apart and, and just doing wild, wild things. Um, some ceramic foam um, that foams prior to firing, not during firing. So the idea of being able to like blow bubbles um, and then sort of have this um, bubble ceramic substrate that gets fired and becomes permanent. And all the while, um, I think, and especially um, uh, with the, those Harvard graduate students, um, was getting introduced to a lot of the paper folding. I'd go to a lot of their, their lectures and um, just start to make some cool stuff and, and sort of draw on those templating uh, skills that we picked up in undergrad. And so this is paper. But the next move was making this in clay. And this is that same material um, that we had developed for, for the uh, droplet work, um, just sprayed onto paper and then fired in the kiln. Um, and, and again, another rendition. Um, so this is some of the mold making process. One of the unique things about this material is that this material can be it can be fired and then it can be built on again and fired again and it'll, it'll adhere to itself. Um, so making these molds, tons of molds, and starting to build these things. I mean, this is like uh, Fantasia with the, um, with the brooms and the, you know, that, whole, that whole scene. Um, starting to build up. And so I build out this mold. And the idea here is that we can do like a macro scale, um, sort of like a, a pate de verre situation um, where, you know, glass is sort of put against this mold. Um, so this uh, ceramic pot gets filled with uh, plaster or plaster silica. And literally taking, taking these fired components and squeezing more material in there and just building up right into the mold. And this is it in the kiln. Um, did not realize how heavy this stuff was gonna be, but it was a good time. And, you know, again, while all these projects are going on, it's just sort of rolling through work and really starting to get things to happen. And, uh, and this was another moment using that same idea of um, being able to take these fired chunks and reassemble them. And then the show comes together. Again, every time these shows come together, it's sort of this nice reflection moment where you can look back in a way that you just can't see in the studio. Um, the, I, I can still hear those um, uh, John Gill's words um, from undergrad where it was just, make stuff and get it out and make stuff and get it out. And that idea of just making space in the studio so that more, more things can sort of build and happen was really big. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that big platter in the front there is just all, all those bits from all the failed um, tests and everything, all the work falling apart, um, started to build out you know, that, that style of work where I could take all those components and just put more material in there and sort of rebuild. Um, from there, headed out to Cranbrook. Um, this is a view of the studios. You can see the kiln stacks and um, towards the w windows on the side is where we all have our studios. Um, and one of my first projects there was just sort of still engaging. This is the same material. Um, it's torn, it's fired, and then reassembled before firing again. Um, in the in these molds, and then sort of starting to reincorporate the brick here. I th there was just there was a ton going on. Um, I, I started to be really interested in in the brick material, um, and that it, it's this sort of alternate um, starting place, and and that was sort of exciting to be able to pull materials. This is fun. This is um, a colleague here, Young, um, it, for that sense of scale there. Um, 
And the other, the other thing that came up um, was I started to use this refractory cement and it was this nice moment of the brick is pre-fired. I could pre-fire some clay components, um, could assemble, uh, could glaze things, could assemble with the refractory mortar. Um, and man, I, I played with so many Legos as a kid and just the ability to sort of do that again with, with real stuff in the world is where it's at. Um, so this is, um, this is sort of the beginning of the, the pandemic circumstance. Um, this is actually the night that uh, Krimrick sent out the shutdown email at like 9.30 at night. Um, this is the work I was engaged in, stuff spread all over the materials room. And so I finished putting these pieces together, tossed them in the kiln, packed up my studio, went home, packed up at home and, and just um, started driving. And um, I was going to drive down to, um, to North Carolina and stay with a friend and that fell through. Um, so partway driving I'm in the middle of Ohio and I'm in this Waffle House parking lot and got to figure out what to do. Um, so I, I drove home to Rhode Island and um, at the time uh, Honeywell um, was renovating a space to start making the N95 masks and decided that that would be a way to fill the time. Um, so I started as a, a temp worker um, and the, the space was so fresh that we were wearing hard hats as they were still putting in the electrical and everything overhead. Um, so worked there for about six months um, and it was cool because the machines and the processes were, were things that were totally new. Um, so I actually got to have input talking to some of the engineers. And again, started out as a temp worker. Um, by the time I had left here, um, it was running uh, two cells in the factory. So it's a quarter of the factory floor, uh, 30 people in each cell. So I had about 60 people um, as part of my team for that section. Um, and so each eight hour shift, um, uh, my team would put out 15 in each cell, so 30,000 masks. Uh, and then across the floor, uh, you know, by four, that, that would be 120,000 masks per shift. Um, and we finally get back to Cranbrook. And there's something about working in the factory that, that just, um, it's industrial and, and it's on a scale that... Um, I think just really got into the work. Um, so these are these massive cylinders and, and sort of all these plugs and parts. Um, it was sort of nice to, to like bisque everything, get everything out, glaze it, and then sort of bring everything back in. And um, so, so this is some of that finished work. Um, and some of what's going on here is, yeah, the, the process is industrial. And I think it's sort of, it's starting to engage some of the industrial craft, um, but also just starting with these simple ideas. Um, so what I really like here is the idea that you can start with a cylinder, you can make some spaces in between, and that can become sort of a strategy um, for glazing, for applying color, and for putting things together. Um, Still have an eye towards towards the brick and, and some of those industrial materials. Um, these are sort of tricky in that they're thrown cylinders. The cylinders are altered. Um, the one on the left here, um, the brick is fired in the kiln in place, and then on the right, the, the part is added. Um, so again, th these are these are you know large scale tests, but it's really starting to to just ask those questions. What if? Um, you know, what if the brick is fired in? What if the brick is, is added after? How do those things feel? What do they look like? And what can they be? And, and of course, um, you know, the building bridges and, and doing all that, that fun stuff. With some of the glaze lab at Cranbrook, um, sort of love um, the ceramic spaces and just the ability to make a mess and sort of make everything happen just kind of constantly churning. Um, so we can see here after some time away, th there's this constant returning to sort of readdress these projects. Um, so this is that same, um, call it the divit material, devitrified material. Um, 
it's essentially a fused silica. And, and these parts are being torn up um, and then fired. Um, so essentially they're like these porcelain rocks. And with these little windows in, in the pots here, um, the very simple idea of driving this is, is that the, the sort of the glaze material, the, the porcelain, the precious stuff can sort of go from being the surface decoration to being very sort of clumsily and, and bluntly injected into or onto the pot. And that the, the pot sort of becomes this armature that in itself it's a vessel, but it also becomes um, sort of a holder for, for these parts. Um, and of course, everything's just looking at scaling up, um, you know, so it's, it's just really, what can we do? Um, God, the studio gets messy and, and that's sort of started to come to terms with that, that like, if, if I'm not making a good mess, then things aren't really happening. Um, but this is sort of, uh, as I'm coming towards that thesis moment and going, oh my God, I've made all this work, but I don't know what a thesis is. Um, or, or what that thesis work might be. And, and so maybe it's something that has to be grand and, and sort of um, bring together all of this. Um, the funny thing about this is this, this piece, I was like, okay, it's done, it's beautiful. Um, I'm gonna try and dry it slowly. I moved it out um, uh, just outside the, the kitchen area in the, the Cranbrook Studios. And um, whatever happened, this thing collapsed sort of like a, um, like a condominium, uh, when they do demolition and, and just the walls drop straight down and everything falls apart. Um, so we remade that. And then the one after that, uh, we decided it could be much taller and, and much thinner and, and much more sliced up and, um, yeah, just about sort of pushing. Uh, the other thing that was really nice too in that that second taller cylinder was just sort of seeing that um, it doesn't have to be this linear space and, and maybe form can start to, to come out and the walls can start to, to open. Um, you know, maybe at some point there doesn't have to be um, the vessel as an idea of like inside and outside, but maybe at some point it could become sort of a, a mesh or an object that just sort of exists with space in it and objects coming together. The other nice little bit is that all these are, are sort of windows and as much as everything gets handled and sort of bought, brought through the process, I mean, I think back to, to the tile making and how easy it is to pull these handmade tile out and, and sort of hold them and just appreciate that like, hey, this, this one tile in itself is a beautiful object. And I think it's the same um, uh, with the porcelain chunks here. Um, each, each part is sort of its own, its own thing. Um, and geez, I mean, that brings us right to the, to the summer, this constant churning. Um, Goggle Works um, is an art center out in Reading, Pennsylvania, um, and ended up receiving this opportunity for what would have been the, the first pandemic summer. And that just, that got pushed back. Um, uh, but the, the summer after, you know, we, we got to sort of re-engage there. And out in rural Pennsylvania, there was this amazing salvage yard. And part of when I, when I was applying, I was talking about the post-industrial energy in the city there and that sense of repurposing and how that would, would play well into the work that I was interested in making. I think that translation really started to, to come through um, where I could use a, a sort of machine like the wheel to sort of make these parts. And, and just assemble. Um, one of the strange things is because the residency is 10 weeks long, I knew I'd be crunched for time. And so I had to make all the big work first. So it's like I'm making the big work as I'm testing and figuring things out, but then I had to scale down towards the end so that everything could dry and get through the process. Um, and, and that was a real, um, it felt backwards, but it felt backwards in a good way. Um, because the, the scale that we build things really affects sort of our, our pacing. And so those moments at the beginning where, where it was sort of, um, it's a new studio and figuring things out, if it was gonna be slow anyway, it might as well be making the big work and, and just sort of chopping through that. 
So towards the end, um, I started um, sort of letting all the clay components dry, and then go. I would go back in with refractory mortar. Um, so it's the stuff when they build kilns that, that sort of uh, holds all the bricks together. You go back in and just build everything out. And that, that was a moment where everything just became immediate and fresh, and it felt like playing with Legos again. I got to churn through a lot of work here um, in a lot of different styles. It, I think I saw it as this moment where I'd done all this testing, and it was the opportunity to take some ideas um, from grad school and, and just sort of balloon those out and sort of see what it is. And one of the amazing things about it um, is that uh, there were three of us residents. Um, so I got to work with um, uh, Taro and, uh, and Dan, who, who are a printmaker and a glassmaker. And uh, so we're living together in this, this actually pretty beautiful um, row house right across the street from studio. Um, and over, over the process, um, I, I don't know that we were seeing a ton of what everyone was doing in studio. We'd sort of get these glimpses here and there, you know, do trips and, and hang out here and there. But um, it was as we started to bring the exhibition together that, that everything sort of started to make sense um, in terms of the, the printmaking, um, Taro with, with sort of the, the patterning and, and the processing um, and that sort of order there. Um, Dan is doing this, this uh, Marini um, technique that's a lot of cut and chopped glass that comes together. Um, and all that work just starts to really sort of play together nicely. Um, and so I think there's just something about seeing the work out in the space and seeing the work with, with other work that I think just helps you see it in a different way. Um, it, it was incredible. I mean, the, the space was just absolutely huge. Um, but all the work starts coming in and, and that space was just packed with work. And uh, that brings us out to California. Um, actually, I haven't taken a uh, photo of the Amoka like studio sign yet, um, but we'll we'll get that. Um, but um, uh, where's my head at? Yeah, I mean, we get out here. Um, uh, we get to go on this amazing Laguna factory tour. Um, I had put a lot of that through the Instagram stories, um, but it was just seeing like how everything is made. Um, and again, just being out here, being back out in California, being in the mountains. Um, uh, Laguna uh, hooks up the residents here with, with all the materials. Um, so this is literally a ton of clay um, with tons of stain, raw materials, um, the refractory mortar, other goodies. And this is sort of some of what I'm starting to get into here. Um, so I'm aware from moving around um, with all the materials being different, everything requires a lot of testing. And I had these samples um, from, uh, from, from graduate school that are these little, I was slicing brick up um, on a tile saw and I put glaze in between everything and then would just sort of fire everything. And, and it create this brick lattice and it sort of re-embraced that idea of the really heavy clay material, the earth stuff, and just getting space inside of there. Um, and so, you know, from there with all the testing, it's, it's just about that sort of um, scaling up. Um, so you can see, uh, this is uh, sort of half of the studio space that I have here um, at Amoco. And, and just sort of starting to, to, you know, make a bunch of components and build out these sort of base forms and, and try and start a dialogue um, between that brick lattice and then some sort of solid um, organic forms. And, and again, the, the plan is to do a talk at the end of the residency here where I can sort of recap and get more into this research and what's going on. I think a lot of the reality is that I, I don't always have the answers or the words or the, or the know-how for a lot of this, but it's really about sort of testing and just sort of following and figuring out where things go. Um, I don't know how the surfaces are going to end up or what we're going to work with or how things will sort of move forward. But I think there's something going on. And 
the goal is just to sort of make enough stuff and ask enough questions and just sort of make it happen. All right. And the, this last little image here, um, so this is a, um, a quick sketch. Um, we have an idea of building a pizza oven here. Um, the firings here at Mocha have been a super good time with the, the salt and soda firing. And um, we've started doing some food stuff. I mean, they, they have a tradition of doing the barbecue and all that. Um, we've done a sushi night where we're making sushi together. Um, the idea here is to sort of rebuild a, a pizza oven um, so we can have that for the firings, for gatherings and the whole thing. Um, so yeah, so just wanna say a quick thanks um, uh, you know, to David, Beth, uh, Nathan, Paul, Pam, Tim, and everyone at the museum here. Um, well as uh, Brian at Laguna um, from the Tyrrell Hookup and also the, the Wingate sponsorship, uh, sponsorship um, here. And um, yeah, thanks so much for coming out today and let's do a quick uh, Q&A. Thanks so much, Colby. That was, a, I think you promised us a visual bombardment. <laughs> I certainly think you accomplished it as far as I'm concerned. Um, We'd love to do a few minutes of Q&A. Folks who are here joining us, feel free to raise your hand or drop your um, questions in the chat and I can ask Colby for you. Colby, I, before we get into it, I just wanted to, to ask you about color in your practice. One of the things is we, you were going through all the slides that really struck me is that your pieces have such variation. Um, you know, sometimes you have these vibrant colors that, and only because you said it multiple times, remind me of Legos. Um, you know, the bright blues, the vibrant reds. Um, but then on the flip side, you have pieces that are very earth toned um, and much more muted. So for you, you know, where do you take your inspiration from color and how does it play a role in your practice? Yeah. Um, I, I'm a really big fan of things sort of being the color that they are. Um, and I'm trying to think how to put it together. So, I, I mean, clay in itself is, is really beautiful. Um, there's some really great clays and anytime that I'm bringing color into the work, um, it, it has to do with sort of the color of materials. And, and that's something we, we get through a lot of the glaze formulation and sort of understanding, Hey, we want to get some, some greens going on. Maybe that's a, a copper, um, the blues, maybe that's a cobalt. Um, and then even, even some of the more sort of bright, uh, plasticky colors, um, in, in my mind, when, when we're starting to bring in stains, um, ceramic stains, um, I want to look at that as a material, um, in itself and, and sort of, um, allow things to sort of be the color that they are and also recognize that that some of the play that's happening is sort of related to to some of the material identity um so one of the things i run into is like with a brick a brick is sort of brick colored a lot of the time and when it's in the form of a brick we know like oh that's a brick but even when the brick material is not in the shape of a brick it still looks like brick um So yeah, I, I don't know quite how that plays in, but I know that those are things that we're thinking about. And so a lot of the color is just coming from, some of it's natural and then some of it's just sort of a, a, a history or a reference of the object and sort of what it is. I really enjoy that exploration, but I see it so much of your work that um, looks at how identity and texture are related to materials. Um, I find that incredibly intriguing. And I know one of the things we've talked about, um, you mentioned that often the transitions between places and practices are often abrupt. I mean, we've talked about what it's like to come to a new residency and explore um, new clay bodies. So I was curious, how, how have you found the clay out here on the West Coast since you arrived in October? Yeah. Um, so, well, so one of the things I did was I actually... Um, I actually ordered a bunch of clays from Laguna um, right from the start. And um, 
the goal was just sort of testing and, and just sort of seeing what that would be. And um, I, I tested out paper clays. I, I can't remember. There were maybe six, seven, or eight different clays I had tested out. Um, so some of it is is like um, it's testing the workability. And, and there's clays that we want just because they work well. And then there, there's other clays that we want because the, you know the color's good. Um, but I started to find some some clays that could um, maybe the edges tear and, and rip in a satisfying way. They have a certain tooth to them. Um, I ended up opting uh, for this Laguna body called Big Pot, which is made for building big pots. Um, and the idea is just to have this uh, this bulletproof clay that um, I can sort of build anything with, and it's going to behave fine. Um, and then the, the Hawaiian red is the the clay that I found was just most brick like. Um, so it's really got that red going on, and um, and and so um, in the previous images, that's where I had um, built with that that big robust stoneware, and then sprayed everything with a, a slip made from the the Hawaiian red. Um, uh, but yeah, everywhere that, I, that I've gone, it's been different materials because it's been a different part of the country, and. Sometimes the effect is just that it drives what you can and can't do with the material. The material sort of tolerates certain things and, and some won't. But I think that also becomes opportunity. And so as we're testing, we're finding, oh, this clay does this really well. Um, and, and so that's pretty pretty amazing to see. I can really imagine what it's like coming from an artistic practice and having to redevelop it as your materials shift and change. We've got a question from uh, Aylin Hughes. Aylin, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your first name. Mm -hmm. She says it's so inspiring, and she's wondering if you have any advice for international artists looking to do these kinds of residencies in the US. Uh, Aylin is from the UK, and we don't, and, uh, says we don't seem to have these kind of places to go to to evolve our practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I. Uh, funnily enough, um, I've sort of I've been keeping my eye on the UK a little bit, um, uh, more specifically London, just because of interest in um, uh, Royal College of Art, um, uh, Royal Academy, and and some of those types of places. Um, the U.S. ceramic scene, um, in some ways, is is pretty insular. Um, we're not always sort of looking elsewhere, um, but a lot of the opportunities that we have. Um, tend to be open for everyone. And I, I think that the toughest thing is like finding the opportunities. Um, so there's a couple of databases um, that I am blanking on right now. Um, uh, Ceramics Monthly puts out a residency listing. Um, Alliance of Artist Communities um, puts out a listing. Uh, and then a lot of it is sort of word of mouth. And, and as you start to build up your network, you, you'll sort of hear about some of the opportunities. Um, but there's a million amazing places. Um, and then the only um, the only thing you, you might need some help with in the U.S. is, is some of the visa um, situations. Um, and... I don't know enough about that, um, but I know these organizations are, are pretty amazing. Um, and it's worth sort of reaching out as you find these opportunities and just see if that's something that they can help manage. Um, speaking for Mocha, I know we're always happy to answer questions. We're thrilled with folks for chat. Getting to talk to people who care about clay is one of the reasons that we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I will add, um, one of the things I would, certainly surmise is that um, the one of the things these residency programs are looking for is that they have established communities, um, but they're really looking for people to come in from the outside and, and bring some new perspectives and ideas. And, you know, being from the UK, you might have some experiences that would be super useful um, to these communities, just super interesting. Um, Anybody else have questions for Colby? Um, well, oh, one thing I'll, I'll mention real quick. Um, I know when I was uh, 
you know, putting a lot of stuff out on Instagram. I had mentioned, um, you know, recipes and, um, and that sort of stuff. And I've taken this stance around recipes where um, I think it's really important that we sort of share as much as we can. Um, if there's anything that I'm doing that you have interest in or any, anything of that sort and you're a, a maker and you, you want those recipes, just email um, and I'm, I'm happy to share that stuff. Um, it, it's one of those things where if we don't have to all spend the same amount of time researching the same stuff over and over again, like it'd be a really great thing. Um, and it, it'd actually be pretty exciting to see with some of these materials. I know what I've been able to do with them, but, but pretty curious, like what other people might be able to do. Well, thanks so much, Colby, and thanks to everyone for joining us here today. Um, there's a recording of the talk that we're putting together over the next couple of days, and you'll get an email from Amoka uh, with a link to that talk when it's ready. As Colby mentioned, we're hoping that he'll return to give another talk towards the end of his residency, so we hope you'll keep a lookout for that in the new year. Um, I also wanted to say thanks and recognize Natalia Arbelez and Kirsten Wilders, who are two of our uh, resident artists from this year. They also joined us here today, so great to see both of you. And many thanks to Alex Ehrlich and Jeffrey Warnock from the Board of Directors who are also joining us here today. Um, it's a pleasure to have this uh, residency program here in MoCA. And as Colby has already so eloquently thanked, many thanks to the Wingate Foundation, to Julianne and David Armstrong, and to Laguna Clay for providing such excellent opportunities for ceramic artists. If you are interested in that application cycle, keep a watch on the MoCA website. It'll come out in December. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And many thanks, Colby, for uh, being such a wonderful addition to our community. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks so much.